Hello and welcome to another Brawl video. Today we're gonna try to annihilate our opponents using this Colossus Eldrazi ramp deck, which is playing Ulamog the Defiler as its commander. When we cast Ulamog, even if it gets countered, we still get to exile half of the opponent's library rounded up, and then Ulamog enters with a number of plus one plus one counters on it, equal to the greatest mana value among cards in exile. So on average you can expect six or seven plus one counters, and then Ulamog also has Annihilator X, where X is the Number of plus one counters on it. So now if Ulamog attacks, the opponent will have to sacrifice maybe six or seven permanents, including maybe their lands if they don't have any other permanents to sacrifice. So Ulamog can be incredibly brutal if the opponent doesn't answer it, and it also has some built-in protection with Ward, forcing the opponent to sacrifice two permanents if they want to target it. So Ulamog is an awesome curve topper for a deck that can ramp into it, especially also if we can give it haste and attack with it the same turn we cast it, because then we get to immediately annihilate the opponent's board. So I've split up the deck into a few different categories. By far the largest one is going to be the ramp section, since getting to 10 mana requires a lot of extra resources. Then we've got a bit of card draw, ways to accumulate extra resources so we can find more ramp in the first place. Then we've got our Eldrazi category, including some support cards as well as additional payoff cards. These aren't strictly necessary since we already have a 10 mana commander that's capable of winning the game by itself, but if we're playing Eldrazi we're playing all of them. And then we've got some additional finishers, as well as the miscellaneous section which includes ways to give Ulamog haste so we can immediately attack with it. So that's the deck in a nutshell. Now for the deep dive, starting with our ramp, we've got lots of two mana options, including the Artificer, only makes mana that we can spend on abilities or casting artifacts, but since most of the deck is colorless artifacts, that's totally fine by me. Then we've got our classic two mana ramp with Cold Steel Heart, Guardian Idol, Mindstone. We've got our Solar Transformer and the Iron Crag. You'll notice we're not playing with the Arcane Signet in this deck because it wouldn't be able to make colorless mana, so that's the drawback of playing a colorless commander. Then we do also have Ornithopter Paradise and the Mirror Convert making colored mana, although potentially at the cost of two life. Then at 3 mana we've got Thran Spider making power stones for each player. Then there's a Burnished Heart which we can sacrifice to get two basics, can only get basic wastes in this deck, so we are playing four of those. Then we've got Inspiring Statuary, making our non-artifact spells have Improvise, so we can now tap artifacts to cast some of our non-artifact spells, including our Eldrazi. Then Mana Geode gets to Scry, we've got the Terminal to maybe loot. Oraska Relic can also be sacrificed later to gain 3 and draw. Pristine Talisman will gain a life whenever we tap it for mana. And then a Skyclave Relic we can occasionally play with Kicker to make additional copies. The Celestus can also gain life as it switches between day and night. And Unstable Obelisk also gives us a bit of removal if we want to sacrifice it later. Then we've got Palladium Mirror tapping for 2 mana, similar to Worn Power Stone, although not being a creature has its advantages. We've got the Urza's Incubator, which will often name Eldrazi, giving those a 2 mana discount. Hedron Archive at 4 mana can immediately tap for 2. Similar to the 4 mana Obelisk from Alchemy, this is the only Alchemy card I'm running. Once we get Thran Dynamo, that's gonna get replaced. Then we've got Solemn Simulacrum, finding once again a basic waste when it enters and drawing a card when it dies. Forsaken Monument is probably the most important ramp card in the deck, as it essentially doubles our mana, since now all our lands produce double colorless, and a lot of our artifacts do as well. So that makes it easy to get to 10 mana. Gilded Lotus immediately taps for 3 colored mana, so a bit of a nombo with Forsaken Monument, which is also why most of the ramp artifacts in the deck produce colorless mana, so they can synergize better with the monument. And then as a Dreamstone Hadron can also tap for 3 colorless right away, can also be sacrificed to draw. And Ugin the Ineffable, a great way to kind of bridge the gap between the early ramp cards and the expensive Eldrazi, also giving us interaction with a minus 3, or making additional spirit tokens with a plus 1. Then in our card draw section there's a Maze Mind Tomb, can also simply tap it to scry 1 to improve our draw steps. Bank Buster is 2 mana to draw a card, can do that a few times until we get a pilot token and a treasure. Treasure Map lets us scry at the cost of 1 mana, eventually transforming into Treasure Cove with 3 treasure tokens. The One Ring, even though it's nerfed and historic, costing 1 mana to activate, is still very powerful as a card draw engine, drawing us more and more cards, and also protecting us the turn we play it. Karn, Sign of Urza, could make Karnstruct tokens with the minus 2, which scale with the number of artifacts we control, although usually we're happy using the plus 1 to often draw into additional lands that the opponent gives us. We've got a Mystic Forge, playing colorless spells off the top of the deck, can also exile the top card of our library. 
The Mind Stone and Weak Stone can be removal, giving a creature minus 5, minus 5 when it enters, and then still making two colorless mana that we can use similar to our Power Stone tokens to cast other artifacts or pay for abilities, but can also maybe draw two when it enters instead. And then the Immortal Sun will shut down all Planeswalkers, so we only have Karn and Ugin, so it's not too much of a nombo, and then can also give our spells a one mana discount, give our creatures plus one plus one, while drawing an additional card each turn. And then uh, taking a look at our Eldrazi, we've got it that heralds the end, giving our expensive Eldrazi a one mana discount while giving them plus one plus one as well. The Flash Raker is excellent with all the cheap artifact, making additional spawn tokens which we can then also sacrifice to make mana. Matter Reshaper is happy to trade or chum block to give us another permanent in return. Roaming Throne naming Eldrazi can be a lot of fun, especially with Annihilator triggers. There's Thought Not Seer taking a look at the opponent's hand to take away their best card. Echoes of Eternity, doubling our colorless spells can also be incredibly powerful, while also doubling our triggered abilities, such as our Annihilator triggers once again. And Devourer of Destiny is great to have in your opening hand, but also fine to cast for 7 mana, exiling an opposing permanent that's one or more colors. Breaker of Creation, another Annihilator Eldrazi, even as an uncommon, still quite strong. We've got Kozilek, the Broken Reality, letting us manifest two cards while drawing and giving those colorless creatures plus three plus two. Kozilek, the Great Distortion, is the one that lets us refuel our hand and maybe pitch cards from our hand to use as counter spells. Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger, a classic, exiling two permanents when we cast it, so even if it gets countered, all these Eldrazi still provide a ton of value. And then a Tantan Indestructible that can also exile the top 20 cards from the opponent if it attacks, so in combination with a Defiler we can certainly mill someone out that way. And then finally the two Emrakuls on Arena, the World Anew, stealing all the opponent's creatures when we cast it, and the Promised End, stealing the opponent's next turn when we cast it, can also be a lot of fun. And finally Kozilex Command, another versatile card, that that can make a bunch of spawn tokens, maybe draw a card, or exile an opposing creature. And then our other finishers include a Cityscape Leveler, which can also help destroy other permanents. We've got Sundering Titan blowing up lots of lands, hopefully we're facing a multicolored deck. And then Portal to Phyrexia, a way to make the opponent sacrifice three creatures, and also slowly bring them back turn after turn. And then the miscellaneous section includes two ways to give our creatures haste. Crashing Drawbridge is the cheapest one, needs to tap to activate. And then Acromas Memorial, in addition to giving all our creatures haste, also gives them Flying, First Strike, Vigilance, Trample and Protection from Black and from Red. So it can also be very effective in certain matchups. And then we also have a Moon Silver Key, can be sacrificed often getting our Forsaken Monument to then double our mana. We've got a Nettle Cyst, which grows with a number of artifacts we control, just a nice roadblock to buy us some time. And then a Sculpting Steel can copy an artifact that's in play, hopefully that's one of our more powerful ramp artifacts. And then a Paradox Engine can also be pretty busted if we have lots of artifacts that tap for mana, as we can repeatedly untap them as we cast more spells, also very good in combination with some of our card draw engines. And then since we are a colorless deck, we get to have a lot of fun in the mana base, including plenty of lands with various activated abilities. They aren't really necessary, I would say. The most important ones here are on the left-hand side, as we've got, of course, a couple ways which we need to search up with some of our effects. And then I'm mostly prioritizing lands that have an effect when they enter the battlefield, most of them either letting us scry one or surveil one, since that will give us a lot of extra card selection to hopefully set up our powerful turns. And then Ugin's Labyrinth is also kind of a must-have if you're playing an Eldrazi deck, as it can potentially pitch an expensive card to then give you an additional mana, which is a big deal. Radiant Fountain gaining some life is always nice. And then Inventor's Fair can steadily gain life, as well as eventually be sacrificed to search up any artifact in our deck. So it can also maybe get our Forsaken Monument, for instance, to then give us access to all those expensive Eldrazi. And then Cavern of Soul making Eldrazi uncounterable is great, while still tapping for colorless mana, so it's still great with a monument. And then we've got a whole host of other lands with activated abilities, we've got some creature lands in there, and other useful effects, but uh, you can take a look at those on your own time. So yeah, for now let's jump into some games and see how the deck does. Okay, we're on the play, facing Kaya, Orzov, Usurper, so a life gain control deck of sorts. We've got a promising hand. Lots of ramp, and then if we can cast Ulamog, that's pretty good. For now, start with maybe a desert, since we can pick it back up with Archway. Although we will likely want to cast a two drop first. 
And then next turn we can go Archway, pick up Sun Scorched, and play 3 drop. Opponent keeping up 2 mana. And then, yeah, maybe Matra Reshaper for now. Can also maybe pressure Kaya if they decide to play it. Even though it doesn't necessarily ramp unless it dies and finds something else. And we even get to surveil. Hidden Grotto is fine. Next turn we can still double spell Relic into a 2-drop. Or I guess double Relic as our opponent plays Power Stone. Okay, so let's surveil, see what's on top. Solemn would be more ramp. Maybe at this point we want an extra finisher. And then, let's see, we've got five mana, so not enough to kick the relic. So then we'll go Oraska Relic into Transformer, seems fine. And then next turn I can play a kick Skyclave Relic. Although I guess we do have to keep in mind that Kaya can exile permanents with mana value 1 or less. I believe the token would still have mana value 3, since it's a copy. So that should be fine. We did give our opponent a creature in Graveyard to exile with Kaya, so they get to gain some life here, which helps transform Sorin. So yeah, that's a powerful Planeswalker. Goes after Reshaper. At least still provides a bit of value here, finding a Kozilex command. So playing Sunscorch Desert can also damage a Planeswalker, which is relevant. Go after Sorin. Could have also finished it off with Guardian Idol, I suppose. But we've got bigger things in mind. So, kick Skyclave Relic. Into it that heralds the end. So if they want to minus, they lose Sorin. Opponent can take our command now with the duress, but we can still cast a Nulamog next turn. I hope you said your goodbyes already. And now Idyllic Tutor can find them an enchantment to maybe set up one of the two card combos. Or they might go for some card draw enchantments. We'll see. And it is Necro. Okay, so can cast Ulamog. Question is can I play an Obelisk first? Yeah, we should be able to play that first. Exile half of their deck. And we'll pressure Sorin. Even though Kaya can ultimate next turn. Yeah, they would be able to deal a lot of damage to themselves with a minus five, but not to us. Dare you. So now they need to answer Ulamog. Or else they lose pretty much their entire board. And now we can maybe start pressuring their Planeswalker some more. Do still have one mana available, so if they cast an Edict effect, I can still animate my Blink Moth Nexus. But it's going to be a better triumph instead. Alright, so we'll just try again next turn. Yeah, the food tokens from Sorin are making it a lot easier to pay the ward. Kaya keeps plussing. We've got four cards in exile. Union gains more life. Could also spend a turn just attacking their planeswalkers here. So we don't have to keep dealing with them. Or I can replay Ulamog and then our opponent needs to have another removal spell at the ready. So it's a close call. Can also activate the obelisk to take something out. 
but that seems unnecessary. Alright, so Sorin down. I'll make sure you and fountains not needed. Alright, pass a turn. Can still activate Obelisk at instant speed. A veto, okay. So that can set up the two card combo if they also have exquisite blood. And now a necro. So I could still activate Obelisk, although Necro they could just activate in response, so it's not very helpful. Yeah, I guess we'll take out Vito then, in case they just slime down Exquisite Blood and combo me next turn. And our opponent's gonna go drawing. There are definitely some Eldrazi I would prefer casting over Ulamog in this spot. If we find Amrakul and take the opponent's turn, we can just win the game by drawing 22 extra cards with Necro. That would be funny. Alright, so our opponent's got a full grip once again. And not quite the Emrakul I had in mind, sadly. This one's better when there's more creatures in play. So we'll go for Ulamog once again. And then by exiling the top half of their library, we might also be exiling some key cards that they need. Can have a look here to see if we maybe exiled Exquisite Blood. Yeah, I don't quite see it. So they might already have it in hand. And there's going to be a Path of Peril with Cleave to wipe the board. Pretty good. So now we need an extra mana to redeploy Ulamog once again. And our opponent's going to go digging with Necro. Alright, let's go with Ulamog once again. Third time's the charm. Opponent has seven cards remaining. And there's Exquisite Blood, so it is gone. That's good news. Archivist flashed in. We do have a couple search effects in our deck. So yeah, Pono needs to win with what they have in hand and left in library, which is not very many cards. We'll go for the throw, it takes out Ulamog. Sadly, not an artifact, so that still counts. And they managed to sacrifice the Necro to the war trigger. So now they can draw from their library as normal. Do have to watch out for Kaya. Can still represent a lot of damage with a minus five. And speaking of Kaya, there's the intangible slayer now. now I'll protect those. Just give up already. So we are under some real pressure, but only five cards left. We fall to 11. So if I cast Emrakul, our opponent can exile it with Kaya still. I can send in some creatures at smaller Kaya for them to replay. Although bigger Kaya can still take us out just by plussing over and over. So maybe making them spend a turn using the minus three is not that bad. So I can play Talisman and still play Amrakul, I believe. As opposed to sending in one of my creatures. Could also 
think about Field of Ruin other than Archivist triggers. I guess it's not optional, so that's actually a way to force them to draw a card. Maybe that was the play. Now we just deal the Archivist. And then I could still Field of Ruin them next turn, perhaps. Ravelry not drawing a card, just making two tokens. And Kaya exiles Amarkul. And Archivist is gone. Well, still just a 1-1 here, so not the end of the world. Put on bottoms. And Fractures are Guardian Idol. So yeah, we're still pretty far from recasting Ulamog, which would still mill them for a little bit. Labyrinth can maybe slow the opponent down as well. So yeah, I don't think there's any point in attacking their Planeswalkers here. I do think Field of Ruin is in order. Just to make them shuffle, basically. And then I could sack Relic to maybe find a better ramp card. How close are we to casting a 60 mana Ulamog? 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So a land would do it. I've already played one for turn. So I don't think we sack the Relic. Do have to remember to gain a life of Pristine Talisman. Kaya definitely does not want to draw cards here. Just a start. And they're ready to potentially ultimate again. Which, uh, yeah, would win them the game. So not loving my chances. So take my turn. Kozilek, that's an interesting twist. So can cast that one. Opponent reprieves. Alright, still get to draw cards at least. And our opponent's down to two cards in their library. And there's Amarakul, the promised end, but it might be too late here. I guess if I cast a Wandering, they cannot target me with Kaya next turn. So that should keep me alive long enough. And then next turn, cast Emrakul, the Promised End. And we can potentially win the game using the opponent's Kaya, which would be pretty funny. So yeah, that's it for now. Can play a treasure map. Although now Enduring Tenacity, does that get around the protection? They're just gonna exile cards from their own graveyard. So we're still at six. Opponents looking at our permanents, can I say key to the archive? All right, so we're still at six. I can cast Emrakul the Promised End, and then just reading Kaya carefully, deals damage to target players, so I can target myself with it to the number of cards that player owns in exile, and you gain that much life. I guess that offsets the damage we would deal. Still an interesting line we have available, or we can just draw from an empty library thanks to the Intangible Slayer, so that's probably the way to go. So we cast both Emrakuls. 
but the promised end, hopefully true to its name here. No need to do anything else. And the turn, and I could also just pass, let the opponent take an extra draw step, but why not do it ourselves? And there we have it, awesome, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Xenothar, a guild kingpin, so controlling blue-black deck. Our hand's not bad, we've got some nice ramp with idol into Hedron Archive. Could even scry one, but I'll wait a turn or so. Because if I draw lands naturally, we don't need to scry towards them. Right, now I might want to scry towards a land. There's us Incubator. I don't have a lot of creatures in hand, so I think we can do better. And then Idol is less likely to get removed as opposed to the Artificer, which we can still play after deploying an Archive. Put on to Ramping as well. Alright, so we're off to a decent start. Can almost empty our hand, and then we're close to casting Ulamog. Nightmare is a good one, however, taking out our creature and next turn making us discard. But uh, we'll still have some nice leftovers. So they can take my memorial. So no hasty Ulamog, sadly. But we can still cast a Kozilek here. Let's see, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah. That should work. Or we can go for a drawbridge. Opponent is keeping up mana for a counter spell, although this is still a cast trigger, so we'll still get to draw a bunch. I think that's more relevant than exiling the top half of the opponent's library. And then we can maybe draw into a land for turn. Opponent with a notion thief, ouch. I was not expecting that one. So our opponent got to draw all those cards instead. Well, at least they have to discard to hand size now. One of the special guests, so you don't see it all that often in Brawl. Baleful Mastery takes out Kozilek. Cannot counter it, since that's a 4-drop. And our opponent still has a pretty full grip, so they likely have some more counter spells left. I think I'll try Mana Geode and then Drawbridge, so we can maybe set up Ulamog with Haste to have it be more impactful. Blast Zone could eventually be an answer to the Thief, but it's not great. Play Drawbridge. And I don't think I bother sending in any of my creatures. Opponent with a Siphon Insight with Flashback. Alright, so just gotta hope they don't have answers to Ulamog. Drawing a Cavern of Souls could make it uncounterable. I doubt our opponent just taps out for Xanathar. Shieldrits, keeping up two mana, so they could still have a counter spell left. All right, well, let's just go for it here and hope for the best. Opponent counter spells. Well, can still try again next turn at least, and I'll still get the cast trigger, exiling the top half of their library. Now a breach the multiverse, so our opponent is tapped out. But they might find some huge Eldrazi. Best they can do here is maybe a Karn. And on their side, there's Rusko. Yep. Alright, well, we'll get to play Ulamog here at least. 
unless they happen to have the counter spell for single blue. Which would be a disaster. Does this matter? Probably not. I guess they can uh, get the mana drain since they don't have the mana to cast it here. Take four. And try again. Opponent's got 12 cards remaining. So we can give Ulamog haste, and then with 10 plus 1 counters, that's Annihilator 10. So they would only have two permanents left, may as well go face since they would just sacrifice Karn anyway. Ulamog, Annihilate, and our opponent scoops it up. Awesome, on to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Brea, so a four-color artifact. Our hand's a little bit on the slow side. Although if we can get treasure map transformed, we'll get some treasure. We can put Paradox Engine to good use with a Mightstone and Weakstone. But yeah, overall the curve seems a tad too high with not enough ramp early. Okay, this one is promising. We're missing an expensive card to pitch to the Labyrinth. But if we can pick that up, we have a pretty nice curve with Ugin making... Our spells cheaper as well. And then the Flesh Raker can generate Eldrazi Spawn, which is another way of ramping. Burnished Heart isn't bad either. Still holding out hope to pitch something to the Labyrinth. Can play the Beacon. And then opponent's keeping up two mana. Maybe start with Flesh Raker. And then we can try and play the Burnished Hearts, potentially immediately sacrifice it as well. As a Tithing Blade makes us sack the Flesh Raker. So I'll have a look with Thought Knots. And see a hand with a couple Planeswalkers. Solemn for Ramp, Braids can draw them more cards. But nothing that really disrupts our game plan too much. So at that point, we're mostly worried about Brea taking out our creatures with the ability. And Tazeret can let them activate it for free. So maybe Tazeret's the pick here. Serpon can run out Brea with a plan of activating next turn, but goes for Solemn for a bit more ramp. Ugin not necessarily the best answer to Brea, since the Thopters will finish it off. And we find our own Solemn. We might run out of uh, basic wastes at this rate. But so it goes. So nothing to imprint. Play Solemn. And then there's two wastes left that the Heart can maybe get next turn. If we draw land, we can also go Ugin and play a 1-mana heart. And there's Sahili now. It's also the buffed version, although not exactly sure what it's changed compared to the original. I believe you needed to tap something with a plus 1 ability, which is no longer the case. Iovec now more card draw. Okay. Take our turn. Mystic Forge is promising. So, probably want to just plus Ugin instead of minusing. So we don't lose it to some flying tokens. And then for now we can attack Sahili, put on my chump to keep it alive. And then just plusing Ugin seems good enough. Alternatively, could try the Echoes of Eternity. Which would also be pretty exciting to get going, but nothing that really synergizes with it. Hmm. I never practiced this fist to fist thing. So yeah, there's nothing that would immediately take out Ugin. 
as far as we know. Some fine uh, getting Ugin going. Braids is next. And our opponent keeps plossing Sahili. So they've got a lot of cards in hand. And now a training ground to activate stuff on the cheap. We'll still cost them at least one mana to activate Brea. And yeah, I could sack Simulacrum here. Although, doesn't guarantee taking out Sahili, so I think I'll decline for now. And a 1-mana Nettlesist is certainly exciting. Okay, so step one might be to deploy Mystic Forge, see what's on top, and take it from there. Find a free treasure map, that's excellent. The one ring, not bad either. So we could play that. Will cost one mana to activate. Sculpting Steel can copy something. Do we want to copy maybe the Mystic Forge? Could also copy Solemn, although we will run out of wastes in the deck. Yeah, I think Mystic Forge makes sense for now. So. Let's see here. Can plus Ugin, so Portal can eventually go to our hand. Since I don't feel the need to take anything out. Land on top. So can draw into it with a one ring and then still play it. And then we've got a Sundering Titan coming up, which would be pretty devastating on this board. So yeah, we wouldn't mind drawing into that one. And then for now, just attack Sahili. And can play an Adelsist. And then we can play a free Mirror Convert as well. Okay, so we've got a pretty impressive board state. And next turn, cast Sundering Titan, hopefully. Opponent takes out Ugin, so no more discount. Although with the Mirror Convert, we can still get to 8 mana. Opponent plays Brea. And they can activate it twice, potentially. Braids triggers, now we have plenty of artifacts we can sacrifice. We'll get rid of a map token, maybe. Or Solemn, so I can draw. That's also reasonable. land coming up, so no need to scry an upkeep. And our opponent does not have counterspell mana available, so this Sundering Titan should resolve. And I see a lot of lands with basic land types we can blow up. Everything except green. So this counts as our plains, our mountain, island, swamp. And yeah, our opponent scoops it up. Awesome, on to the next one. Alright, we're on the draw, facing Helga, so kind of a creature ramp deck. It's gonna be pretty scary to face, since our opponent can make mana potentially a lot faster than we can. For now, we can maybe wait a turn to scry until we have a bit more info. Gonna decline Roaming Throne, just need to hit our land drops and prioritize Mindstone over Drawbridge. So we can already play the 4 mana Obelisk into Drawbridge next turn. Q 
Kiora to untap their lands or other mana creatures. But yeah, at least it didn't lead with Helga. Full name Eldrazi. So we've got a decent start. Hopefully we can keep hitting those land drops. At the very least we can play Obelisk into Solemn. And our opponent's got their own roaming throne. Naming Druid. Our land is excellent. So still going for Obelisk plus Solemn. Don't think there's a need to use Demolition Field, is there? Yeah, it would also leave me a mana short of playing Solemn afterwards. And no need to activate drawbridge. So how much mana are we working with? Five, six, seven, eight, nine. So just a land away from Ulamog potentially. Can already cast our nine drops. But our opponent's got the answer with the enchanter. Going for obelisk. Alright, so that slows us down by quite a few turns. So, kind of want to trump with Solemn if they attack. Find a Mystic Forge, that's a good one. If we can find more spells of the top we can cast. It's going to be an Archway. I think I actually draw into it with Mindstone to hit my land for turn. And Palladium Mirror on top. That one will have to wait. And then... Do I have any deserts? I don't think so. But we can pick up the Grotto to scry one again next turn. And then it's probably fine to draw into Palladium Mirror, so no need to exile it with Forge. Helga makes an appearance. So that can eventually make a lot of additional mana. Alright, our opponent just passes with 4 mana untapped. Possible they have some counter spells in hand. But uh, yeah, we can test out the waters with Palladium Mirror. With Drawbridge I can give it haste so it can immediately tap for mana. So that's pretty neat. And then now maybe use Grotto to scry a land to the bottom. Since we might find something we can cast with Mystic Forge like Karn. I can plus, or I can activate Drawbridge, so I can immediately cast uh, Artificer, and then maybe plus Karn, making a large Karn struct also reasonable. We get to land, and there's a leveler on top which we can keep. Okay, pass it back. And Serac and Goreclaw is next. We'll give other creatures haste. They can still make a bunch of mana with Helga and Kiora, so yeah, that's scary. Roaming Throne giving Helga additional counters. The ocean surges, life thrives. And Overlord of the Flood Pits to draw. Okay. So they can immediately attack with it, thanks to Serac. Take out Karn. And our opponent's seeing a lot of cards. So we've got our work cut out for us. I probably have to start by taking out Helga with the leveler, just to slow down the opponent's mana development. And I don't think we bother blocking. There are greater battles to fight. 
Now I guess with the drawbridge we can also immediately attack with leveler, so that's nice. And a ward power stone on top. So play a leveler, and then I can still play power stone as well. Just double checking here that the math works out. But yeah, I notice Palladiumir and Artificer still good to go. And then, yeah, I don't think Yora has a problem if Helga is down. So we can start by taking out Surak, attack, take out Helga while attacking Kiora. So that was a good turn. And then next turn we can try Ulamog. Hopefully there's no Crater Hoof Behemoth in our future. It's gonna be a Galtine Mavern. At least that one doesn't have haste. Would have had haste with Serac in play, so glad we dealt with it. And an Odawara Bouncing Solemn. Okay, that's very aggressive. And there's something I'm not seeing. Are we just dead to the Galta trigger? It's not a Druid, so it doesn't benefit from Roaming Throne. And I can block. So we fall to three. Take my turn. And then it's gotta be time for Ulamog. The one ring could also protect us. Might still be able to cast it afterwards, but we'll see if Ulamog is big enough to just end it here. 1919, yeah, that's probably good enough. But I'll play the ring just in case. Activate drawbridge and annihilate. Clear Galta. And uh, not quite an attack for lethal, but very close opponent would fall to one, but then Annihilator 12 is probably going to be good enough. Awesome, on to the next one. All right, we're on the draw, facing Nahiri, so an equipment deck. Our hands got Mirror Convert as early mana acceleration, and then the uh, Dreamstone would be a nice way to get to 10 mana. So I'm willing to give this a try. Hopefully we'll find something to kind of bridge the gap between two and six. And then any preferences, I guess we wouldn't mind surveilling here. See if we can find some other ramp card. We have plenty of lands already, so we can bottom those. Opponent surveils as well. And Urza's Cave is a way to get whatever land we want, including potentially the uh, Labyrinth, which is a way of ramping, but Needing to sacrifice the cave kind of uh, undoes all the work we would do with it. So yeah, just gonna go ahead and play the converts. And drawbridge is also pretty exciting with the defiler. And our opponent with Sram. Immediately drawing off the Soul Stealer axe. Celestis isn't bad, so we can play that, plus a drawbridge. And then next turn we could play the Hadron. And Dragonwing Glider can hit us for four. And our opponent's got some equipment in play to damage our creatures with. But yeah, we don't really care. Play Cold Steel Heart. Naming probably red or white makes sense. And now 
Astor can let them equip things for one mana. But yeah, if they don't answer the drawbridge, we could have a hasty Ulamog getting in there. Which I imagine is better than playing the Ceaseless Hunger, even though we get to pinpoint whatever we want to take out. Alright, let's go for it. Only got 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters, since the opponent's curve is relatively low. Still Annihilator 5 has to be worth it. And then next turn we can follow it up with a Ceaseless Hunger. Not too far from milling the opponent out with that as well. Okay, opponent keeps their important creatures and two lanes. So we'll see if uh, they can still get there next turn. It's not impossible. A mirror Convert is happy to chum block if needed. Is their opponent reduced to 3 mana? Fateful Absence, an answer to Ulamog. Although they have to sacrifice two more permanents. So it hasn't been pretty, but they managed to answer it. Although I've got bad news for the opponents, there's another Ulamog incoming. And I guess we can do some math here. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I could just recast the Defiler once again. So it seems safe enough to take 8. And yeah, let's try again, unless we're afraid of Mana Tithe countering Ulamog. In which case going for the Ceaseless Hunger is probably better, because then we can attack with the Mirror Converts. Don't quite have enough mana for Mutavolt, I guess. Can exile their untapped lanes, plus maybe the Glider itself. So the Rebel's no longer a concern. And our opponent explodes. Awesome. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the draw, facing Nethroy, a graveyard deck. Our hand's got potential. We've got some cheaper ramp cards. Ugin to bridge the gap towards our 10 mana, Eldrazi. Bangbuster to draw. Probably don't want to activate Sanitarium when our opponent's actively interested in discarding some expensive creatures that they can then maybe reanimate with the Mutate. For now, play the Mirror Converts. Opponent with a Chromatic Lantern. So we can double spell Mana Geode. With, I want to say, Maze Mind Tomb. So we can maybe scry towards an extra land for next turn. We can scry in the opponent's end step and once again in our upkeep, so important to set a stop. Six lets them replay permanence out of the graveyard. And I'll keep a beacon. So I can play Ugin, take out six, and play a bunch of free artifacts. I guess it that heralds the end still costs one colorless mana, so we'll have to wait on that one. Bone could fire up the cottage to pressure Ugin. Goes for Mothra, aka a luminous brood moth instead. And now Nantuko bestowed to start making copies of it, all right. Make sure to put another upkeep stop. Bonders Enclave, I think land is fine. Don't need to be too picky. All right, so playing it that heralds the end is essentially free, since it gives us a one mana discount on the more expensive Eldrazi. And then what's next? Yeah, we're a little bit short of casting Ulamog. So then we will lose Ugin. Portal to Phyrexia could be exciting. Can just draw with Maze Mind Tomb. Find 
the treasure map, which I can still play for free. Draw with Bankbuster, and then scry with treasure map. And play one mana obelisk, so still got some good use out of Ugin. So our opponent gets an extra Mothra. At least we get to enjoy the animation once again. And Ugin down. So, be it. so we'll scry with the map. Keep a lands. And then we should be able to play a 9 mana Ulamog here. And the Filer versus Ceaseless Hunger. With Ceaseless Hunger, we can take out the Broodmoth, exiling it in the process. So that seems important. And then at this point, maybe go for Lantern. So now our opponent just makes 1-1s one with an Antuko instead of 3-4 flyers. Those are good fodder for Annihilator triggers, to be honest. Nathroi can just get back 6. So not the end of the world. Okay, so we're facing a couple flyers here. Blocking their creatures means they just get them back with flying. But I also don't want to keep getting bullied and take the damage, so I guess I'll block them. And then we want to make sure to cast Ulamog before we attack with a Ceaseless Hunger. So we exile more cards out of their library. So I'm not going to scry, since I need all my mana here, I think. Alright, now with the Grey Havens, I get to scry one. Cold Steel Heart can go. So if I were to cast Ulamog, I can still tap the mirror to maybe scry with the treasure map. So, opponent's got 41 cards remaining. Attack with Ulamog. They can make a flying 6, so do we die next turn? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, I guess we do. Unless Maze Mind Tome gains 4 life. So we should still be alive then. And then if I attack once again with Ulamog, they will have no cards remaining. Cottage activates. So we don't want to lose life to the converts. Go to blockers. And that's all we can block. And gain four life. So we should barely survive here. Four life, that's the life we gained with our Maze Mind Tome. And now if they don't have an answer to the Ceaseless Hunger, they're just gonna untap and lose the game. Yeah, in hindsight, maybe Ceaseless Hunger could have exiled an extra Broodmoth instead of the Lantern. But yeah, our opponent realizes what's about to happen and explodes. Awesome, on to the next one.
Okay, we're on the play, facing Joyra, a blue rat kind of storm deck looking to play lots of cheap spells, draw lots of cards, and take over from there. Our hand is probably not the worst. Can play Thought Knot for Disruption. Echoes would be fun, although we're missing some two mana accelerant. So I think I actually take a mulligan. This is a bit better. Yeah, in this matchup, if the opponent's packing a lot of counter spells, we could be in trouble. If they can draw a lot of cards while slowing us down. We'll scry. A land I'll keep. Better opponents probably playing a lot of ramp artifacts themselves. As we see a signet. Alright, so chances of Palladium Mirror surviving are pretty slim. Maybe wait a turn to scry. Yeah, I think I still go with the mirror. It's not like I would have been able to double spell, and we can do that next turn even if the mirror dies. Alright, opponents got the boots to protect their commander. And an incubator now is next. Opponent is keeping up two mana for a potential counter spell. Important to note. So it's a good turn to cast lots of cheaper spells. Crawling Barons I'll still keep on top. And then maybe go for Obelisk. Into a Talisman. And if that resolves we can play the Incubator. Still naming Eldrazi. Even though Leveler would benefit from naming Construct. I expect we'll have to replay Ulamog a few times. So yeah, getting to untap with the uh, mirror was quite nice. Opponent now bouncing it back to slow us down, but the damage has been done. So with a land, we'll be able to cast Ulamog. Never mind, opponent's bouncing everything back. So a lot of interaction, but our opponent also had to set themselves back a bit. So what's the fastest way to rebuild? Maybe go Obelisk into Mir. Alright, another bounce spell. Surprised to see that many after they initially ignored the uh, Palladium Mirror. So that also kind of highlights the importance of just hitting our land drops, since at least we're ahead in that aspect. So now we can go Archive into Iron Crag into Palladium Mirror. And again, maximize our mana development. So next turn we could once again attempt to cast Ulamog. Opponent finally deploys Jora, but no boots to protect it. Just a zero mana artifact to draw. Yeah, the opponent's curve will be pretty low, so we're not going to get as many plus one counters on Ulamog. But that's alright. Opponent still potentially keeping up a wash away for a single blue. So they could have a counter spell at the ready, which is a reason to maybe play a leveler instead. Bobble sacrificed. Alright, so try Talisman. That resolves pretty swiftly. Although again, Wash Away would only hold priority if we cast Ulamog. So I think it's still fine to play a leveler first. Take out Joyra. And hit you for two. And there's Joyra again. Still a mana up for Wash Away. But now an Ugin as well. So we can start there. Take out Joyra. Or Leveler attacking can do it. Although now Leveler could blow up Arcane Signet, which would leave them unable to counter Ulamog. And our opponent explodes. Awesome. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Kona Rescue Beastie. This cannot be a great matchup, since your opponent can already cheat some huge creatures into play on turn 4, or even turn 3. 
and we don't have much interaction. That being said, we do have a decent hand, with Devourer improving our opening hand, and then some 2 and 3 mana acceleration. So maybe we'll find some good 4 and 5 mana ramp to keep the ball rolling. Immortal Sun versus a land here, so a Transformer, Relic, and then I could get Immortal Sun mana on the following turn. Yeah, I guess we'll try it. But again, if our opponent's got a functional hand, we might already be in trouble by then. So maybe now it's fine to scry, see if we can find a good 4 mana card. Sundering Titan's not great against mono green. So that can certainly go. And then we still need to find an extra land to play Mortal Sun on turn 4. Fanatic of Veronos is excellent. And then I guess we'll go for Celestus. Opponent does run out Kona. Devourer, an answer to it, but we don't have the mana for it yet. And no mana for Immortal Sun either, so keeping that did not quite pan out. Alright, so if our opponent got something expensive, they can either cast it with Fnatic or cheat it and play with Kona. So they could do it twice. At least next turn we can attempt Devourer. Gonna be a Guardian Project, that's not too bad. Just take five, and then they still get the survival trigger. And an Exbloom Ancient we can now remove with the Devourer. So it could have been a lot worse. And now a 6-6 six, six gets in the way of Kona, although they still have a 4-powered creature to enable Fnatic, so it's still 8 mana. Sanctum Weaver, draw a card. What they need is some sort of vehicle to tap Kona. Stalwart can do it next turn. And Eladamri can also do it next turn. So there's a lot leading up to that. In the meantime, Project drawing a lot of cards. And Kona attacks, I'll block. It's a bit of a strange attack, I guess. All right, so what's next? Can go Immortal Sun, play one mana Mindstone. It's probably the best I can do. And I'll hang back. Although opponent can still play Kona and immediately tap it. But at this point, Teladumri can do the same. And a Hornet Queen's not bad. Lots of flying death-touching tokens to get in the way of Earl Drazi. And an Overlord's next. So I think the play is probably still going to be... A Chroma's Memorial before Ulamog, just to immediately attack with it. Alright, so we've got some powerful Eldrazi to work with. Yeah, I think I like Memorial. The combination of First Strike and Trample means they don't have a great chum block anymore. The Var can attack. And Death Touch is irrelevant when we have First Strike. Your opponent takes it. Pass a turn. Could have maybe kept Mutavolt untapped. Still very dead to a Crater Hoof Behemoth, if that's what they have. So Kona is tapped. And it's going to be a Soul of the Harvest for more card draw. Okay, still potentially beatable. They can still activate a Ladamri to cheat something in play. And they'll have the Kona trigger. Ethika's Chariot is acceptable. So yeah, we should be able to play Ulamog now. Unless the Kona survival trigger will mess that up. It's 
It's gonna be the Crown of Winter. Interesting. So they can actually use that to tap down my Ulamog. Although they will have to pay the ward. But yeah, that does uh, prevent us from attacking with it. So I guess mission accomplished. Was not expecting that one. The Great Distortion. So there's no lack of powerful Eldrazi we can cast. Opponents looking to tap down Devour. That would be surprising, I guess. Yeah, that works for me. So now if we get a large enough Ulamog, we could just end the game. And that's gotta be the play. Just enough mana. Putin does still have some flying blockers, of course. And that's a 17-17 Ulamog. So it's not quite lethal, but uh, still get to annihilate for 9. So should be able to survive the attack back next turn. Our opponent giving up most of their lands. And we do have Trample, so our opponent still falls to two. And then next turn there is going to be more hasty Eldrazi coming up. So the crown doesn't necessarily stop us. But yeah, something like a Crater Hoof Behemoth off El Adamari would still do it. So that hasn't changed. They're going to tap down Ulamog right now. Yeah, but they're planning to sacrifice lands. They might have wanted to tap those first. Crown is gone. So yeah, this attack's not quite lethal. It is close. We're at one. So had they not jumped with the uh, insect last turn, they would have killed us. And now is a Pondrial, a big reach creature. Alright, so looks like we'll get to untap. And our opponent explodes. Yeah, next turn we can cast any number of additional Eldrazi, but our current ones will already get the job done. So very close one here against Kona, but uh, needed all the luck on our side. On to the next one. Okay, we're on the play, facing Omnath, Locus of All, a five-color deck. It's the battle of the tentacle monsters. This hand has a lot of three mana ramp, no real two mana acceleration. So I think we can do better. Well, Sundering Titan is probably a game over if we can cast it. So I'll give it a shot. And then I can start by scrying. For more revolts, land is probably good enough. Even though a two mana ramp card could have been better. And then, for now, still play Bankbuster. I'm thinking turn 3 Mana Geode, and then turn after we can play the Archway. A leveler seems redundant when we already have an 8 mana play. Our opponent off to a slower start as well. And Pristine Talisman the draw. So I can play that, Archway pick up our Scry lanes, and then still draw with Bankbuster. So we're two turns away from Sundering Titan, and get to drop an Immortal Sun in the meantime. So our opponent might get to untap with Omnath one turn. Which, uh, yeah, can be quite scary if they immediately hit some multicolored spell. We could fall behind. Put on fetching an untapped Overgrown Tomb, so we might see a 3-mana instance, Maestro's Charm. Cultivate now, so at least no Omnath on turn 4. So that gives us an extra turn to try and deploy Sundering Titan. And yeah, all those juicy tri lands are perfect for Sundering Titan to blow up. So we'll draw. And then Scry. Desert doesn't seem needed. Play Mortal Sun. And a one mana convert. And that's even enough to crew the Bankbuster. 
get you for five. And hopefully next turn, a juicy Sundering Titan. We've got islands, plains, mountain, swamp, and forest, so that's five lands for the price of one card. Now they do still potentially have counterspell mana available. But now looking at our lands, if they can blow up a land like the archway, they can set us back. It's gonna be a Grim Tutor. Okay, so our opponent's tapped out. Probably searching some big finisher or something that can blow up artifacts. But uh, yeah, they may not get the chance to cast it. And then I can even play a relic first. Oh yes. And <laughs> that's gonna be good enough. All right, so we got to see our Eldrazi ramp deck in action. And yeah, if you can get to 10 mana and actually attack with Ulamog, you're pretty likely to win the game. Although getting to that point is not always easy, since Brawl is a very fast format nowadays with a lot of powerful commanders to choose from. So if you're looking for a slightly more competitive commander to pilot your colorless decks, I can suggest either the Ceaseless Hunger, which at least if it gets removed or countered will still exile the two most problematic permanents on the battlefield, or you could try Uga at 6 mana, which kind of helps bridge the gap between your early ramp cards and your more expensive Eldrazi, while also giving you more reliable interaction, so that's maybe a better choice as commander. But of course switching commander might also affect the matchmaking, so you might end up facing more powerful commanders as well. So it's always a bit of a balancing act, and uh, usually I just suggest going for whatever seems more fun to you. So yeah, that's gonna do it for today's gameplay. Wanna thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day.